just let us know when you're recording and I'll pretty much get us rolling. Cool. Just started us up in seconds ago. Oh, cool. So, uh, welcome to the Strength Athlete Podcast, episode number 12. This is going to be a little bit of a Q&A and we have a special guest with us here today, uh, Silent Mike who has, you know, uh, a long list of exciting credentials, uh, Burger Flipper among them. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> number one and Burger Flipper. Number one Burger Flipper. And uh, Mike, if you want to say what's up, uh, guys, we got Bryce and Eric here with us as well. Hey, how's it going? What's Hello. up, fellas? What's up, Internet? What's up, Internet? <laughs> uh, so before we, before we get rolling, just a quick shout out to the podcast sponsor, LBD Fitness. Uh, they are donating clean water to people in need for every single item sold. So if you want to check them out, you can find them at www.lvdfitness.com. Bryce is pimping out that LBD uh, crew neck over there with their sweet little logo. Uh, and yeah, check them out. They do some pretty cool things. Uh, additional small request, if you are listening to us on iTunes or if you have iTunes or if you have an iPhone, uh, so this probably is every single person listening, uh, <laughs> please go leave us a review in the iTunes store. Five stars would be great. Uh, tell us about how handsome Silent Mike is and I have how a droid. you think his hat is. I have a droid. How do I do that? You have iTunes on your computer there, Mike. You can look it up uh, in the iTunes store. You're and right. don't, they have iTunes, leave... don't they have iTunes on uh, Android phones now? I was telling uh, uh, Handy before we get in this, I'm so bad at technology, even though my whole life is surrounded by technology. Yeah, he my actually job, still plays anything. Snake on a Nokia phone. Dude, if I could, <laughs> if I could, I would. <laughs> Spent maybe an hour playing that game. I'm surprised they haven't remade that. Uh, they did, that? actually. Uh, Nokia recently released a... Um, it was it was like a luxury version of an old-school Nokia phone with just the classic 12-number keyboard oh, and... Good. And like the the old, uh, I forget the OLED. I think is the style of the screen. No, that's I don't really know what what it's called. But basically, the one where it has the gray and greenish squares. Yeah, so um, good. Yeah, yeah. that's. Andy, I heard about that, dude. Um, smartphones have gotten so smart now that a lot of people just want a device that makes calls again. Yeah. So it's del- Nokia is <laughs> like, we got you covered. Yeah. Now it's now we have like phones. Size. Size, they like went uh, small, like the Razor when I was in high school was like the thinnest, smallest phone. They had a phone this big, and then now like iPhones are getting bigger and bigger. They're going to be down to like a phone in a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. It's Well, you know, it's it's funny. We've gotten to the point we used to call it smartphone if it had internet on it. It was like, oh, I got a smartphone, and you had that shitty internet that would, that would you know, take 10 minutes to load Yahoo. And, um, and Yahoo is kind of the correct generational thing to refer to from then. Yeah. But – now we just call them phones and like Nokia's little cheat model is going to be called a dumb phone. Yeah, yeah. And so Not that's basically where, where we're headed with that. So uh, back on topic a little bit. Uh, Mike, so so many things going on for you lately, man. Lately, man. You've got uh, you've got Kaizen rolling now. Uh, you just what today or yesterday announced you got that sponsorship with Barbell Brigade, um, not to be confused with an employment by Barbell <laughs> Brigade. And, right. Um, and you know you you recently kind of stepped down from from super training and slingshot, and so I'm I'm curious, you know, the, the direction your life is taking you in, kind of, well, like what was? Let's maybe kind of start from the beginning with the cessation of uh, at super training. What, you know, if you can give us a little bit of insight into what happened there, I'd be interested to know. Yeah, I think the uh, main thing is that I wanted my life to have uh, no direction. So the direction I'm heading in is uh, whatever pops up. Uh, whatever I can do, whatever I want to do. Like example, uh, silly one, but my girlfriend texted me yesterday and said, hey, Kendrick Lamar is having a concert in, in Sacramento where I am in August. Uh, you want me to buy tickets? I like Kendrick Lamar, I like hip hop. And I kind of like told her like, ah, I don't know, because I don't even want to be locked down to something I want to go to. That's two months from now. And I just don't like, I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know, man, I might hate Kendrick Lamar in two months. I don't know. Uh, point being, uh, Slingshot gave me a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think I gave Slingshot a lot. I worked there for uh, over four years. I was part of super training uh, as a team member and kind of a coach type position for four or five years also. Um, there's zero bad blood for the internet. <clears throat> I wish I had some juicy gossip uh, to make this episode a lot more exciting. But uh, I've been there uh, since uh, resigning as an employee. Um, I was an employee, uh, so I don't know what people think I was, but I worked for Slingshot. I worked for uh, Mr. Mark Smelly Bell, uh, and everything was good. Everything was really good. Uh, but uh, I like to think of myself as a little snowflake, uh, that I have some gifts, that I can do some cool things on my own. Uh, and I think the reason 
all of us are kind of in the world we are in uh, is to be self-employed and to do what we want to do. Um, and so that's just where my life took me. Uh, you know, we joked before about being an employee or opening a franchise or this and that. If I had worked for um, whatever company it might have been, 24-hour fitness, uh, you wouldn't think any different if I moved on to another job or another opportunity. Uh, that's just kind of how life flows. Uh, and yes, it is a little more intimate because they are my friends. They were my friends. We are still friends, uh, all the super training guys. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, that's about it. Not much. Yeah, I, I imagine it would probably, just based on the amount of content that they put out, it would probably be incredibly time consuming to to try to do something else while simultaneously kind of maintaining your presence on the podcast because you were, you were basically in, in every piece of content they put out, it seemed. Yeah, I... I Everything at Super Training was a little weird, I guess, because I was the first employee. Uh, we worked out of Mark's house and garage five years ago. Uh, literally, I was packing slingshots. So at that point, I was literally the burger guy. I'm literally printing labels, shoving slingshots into a thing, tightening them up, shipping them out. Uh, and then things progressed just kind of quick where the company progressed and they didn't have employees. And Mark was kind of running the whole deal with his wife. Uh, so I hopped, uh, I wore a lot of hats, if that makes sense. I was helping research and development. I was helping product development. I was helping, obviously, with the content, the social media marketing. Uh, I started and started to run the ambassador program and social uh, media marketing. Uh, and then the podcast came about, expos, et cetera. The list kind of goes on. Uh, and so as the company grew, obviously, more employees came. Uh, and everything started to explode. And it became uh, just different. Everything exploded. So uh, – in that regard, yeah, I was very busy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, happiness is number one. And not to say I wasn't happy there, but I'm, I'm definitely happiest when I get to do whatever the hell it is I want to do, like talk to you guys and drink coffee. Absolutely. It sounds to That's... me like you – can you guys hear me, by the way? I just switched to a um, headset. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Uh, it, it sounds to me like you had your finger on the pulse of a lot of, like, just important things that helped drive the company, you know, like – what do, what do people want to hear, you know, and, and just kind of hearing you talk on, on a lot of the episodes of the Super Training Podcast is like the back and forth between you and Mike and stuff like you just kind of drove the conversation forward uh, and asked a lot of interesting questions too. And I know that you're big on, in terms of social media and stuff. So I'm sure that was really helpful. Do you know what Mark is doing now? Like, is he headed in any different direction or, uh, you know? Yeah. You uh, touch? Yeah, we text here and there. Uh, I've been to Super Training a couple times, grabbed a workout. Uh, I don't think they're heading anywhere else. You know, I think Mark's goal is always to create content, to always push. Uh, and, and I think we did not clash by any means, so don't get this misconstrued. But we are very similar, uh, where we both uh, just want to push and we want to be the best and we want to create the most content and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's why we, we meshed so well, actually. Uh, and that's still kind of my goal from day one uh, with whatever company I end up with, you know, put out the best content I can, reach the most amount of people I can. Uh, and for the last four years, it was with Slingshot. And for the next four years, it may be by myself. It may be for the Green Bay Packers. It may be for the New York Jets. Who knows? A man could dream about having that job for the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Do I'll run their Instagram. I'm down. <laughs> a couple, two, two million followers there or something. That's, that's to pretty... post my selfies all the time on Lambo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Follow me on at Silent Mike. Uh, <laughs> so be, beyond kind of what happened there, now, you know, I, I know a lot of people are kind of confused with your announcement regarding Barbell Brigade within the past kind of 36 hours, thinking it's it's kind of replacing one relationship another, with another when kind of, you know, you're talking about two different things, um, yeah. employment versus sponsorship. Yeah, I was an employee of Slingshot. Uh, I guess I was a pseudo-sponsored athlete there, but, uh, you know, obviously when you work with your friends and you help create something, you're going to wear it. I still wear Slingshot knee sleeves and wrist wraps, just is how it goes. Uh, but with Barbara Brigade, uh, they've obviously been friends of mine for a long time. Uh, I did a seminar there with Mark at their latest location before the gym even opened. Uh, it was a gym, but we did it, you know. So it's been a long relationship. Bart Kwan's one of my best friends. Uh, and I was just honored enough that they want to sponsor me, which basically means, uh, for lack of a better term, you're a walking billboard for that brand. Um, sometimes that's financial, sometimes that's just product, and sometimes that's just friendship uh, for those out there that dream to be sponsored. Sponsorship is cool, and it is an honor, uh, but it maybe shouldn't be a life goal. 
Yeah, you know, everyone, I, I think people have it misconstrued, really. The walking billboard is a, is a perfect description. That's about as sexy as it gets. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you get your, you, you maybe you, for certain certain people who are big influencers, they get some amount of money, but it's not like, it's not like you're getting a salary when you're, at least from a powerlifting sponsorship perspective, it's when you're talking about maybe someone like, you know, Dwayne Johnson, maybe, maybe that guy, you would yeah. have to pay him a million dollars a year or something, but probably actually, or more, <laughs> but <laughs> But someone, you know, like like one of us or someone who's in the powerlifting community for the most part, it's it's not like a salaryable, salaryable, um, a livable amount of money. Yeah, I don't know when that uh, kind of came about. Maybe, you know, I heard in the 90s, Ronnie Coleman and some of these guys were getting uh, six, seven figure contracts for some of the supplement companies. Um, but as far as I know, that's very... Yeah, body, not very body common. Building. Yeah, bodybuilding is the even for bodybuilding, you know, I heard it's not that common. You you see all these bodybuilders opening their own companies now, which tells you that they can make more money with their own company than they could with a sponsorship. So, well, a lot of them probably figured out like I can just take out the middleman and do this on my own. But you know, I think even in the past, maybe not so much anymore. Actually, a, a lot of the strongmen, like sponsored by Metrex, were making a lot of money. You know, like Metrex yeah. was a powerhouse in terms of um, strongman stuff and. Marius Pujanowski and a few of those other guys, I'm sure, sure were rolling yeah. in a little decent amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they definitely were. And, and metrics, I, I don't think they went bankrupt by any means, but they definitely uh, scaled back on a lot of things they yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't even you don't even see their protein bars in gas stations anymore. Those guys yeah. have kind of yeah disappeared. I don't know why. I, I like their protein bars just fine. That's kind of my meter for for where any any kind of <laughs> brand is at. If they make protein yeah. bars, can I find them in Seven Eleven? If I can't, then they're kind of headed downhill. Well, Quest yeah. blew up, dude. I remember seeing Quest bars and gas stations being like, "Whoa, Quest!" Like, damn. Yeah. They're in they're in low end grocery stores here now. Yeah. Like yeah. just like pick and save type places, you can get Quest bars, and so that that says to me they've officially well they've been giant for a long time, but you know that's when you've kind of surpassed the marker of just talking to the supplement buying world. Yeah, I think Quest. Uh, I may be wrong. I spit out a bunch of facts that are only like half checked, so you guys can just tell me I'm <laughs> full of shit. But I'm pretty You're sure Quest was. Uh, yeah, I am. They were on like a list, like top 200 uh, fastest growing companies uh, within the last two or three years. Um, I saw that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I saw that See? as well. There's some kind of fact in there. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Have they? Are they? Does, do any of you guys know if they're publicly traded or if they've done an IPO? Ooh, you know I mean? that I don't know. Yeah, that I don't uh, know. I, I've I've met two of their owners, but I don't know if they're. Again, yeah, you don't know. People like uh, are faces of companies and kind of owners and then kind of not. You know what actually is in paper is uh, often very different. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested to see if they became a publicly traded company. How that would how that would go? Yeah, I, I suspect it would make the quality go downhill, but uh, potentially. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any, anyway, so oh yeah, Eric, go ahead. So Mike, now that you have a little more freedom over your career path, I guess, what are some things that you would like to accomplish over the next few years? Yeah, I think uh, you know one of my goals, again, jokingly or not, uh, I said a long time ago on our podcast, I want to teach Ellen DeGeneres how to deadlift. <laughs> and uh, that's like a small thing uh, to a big thing uh, where all these kind of TV fitness shows, uh, newspapers, magazines, I think they still do a very poor job of explaining fitness. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit American culture of uh, the quick fix, the three-day diet, the 20-minute the, the workout to get jacked. Uh, and so my overall mission, I know this is vague and philosophical, but it's just to change that culture as much as I can. So whether that's through my YouTube or some of my network or I don't know how I'm going to do it, uh, getting in bigger publications or getting my face somewhere, uh, I'd like to start to change the uh, general perception of what fitness is uh, and how to actually reach it, how to make it. So, you, you know, powerlifters, yeah, we'll spend three hours in, in a training session, but we're really pushing our limits. But someone can get a good squat deadlift session for half an hour, an hour, and still make real progress, progressive overload, just general principles uh, of truth. Uh, try to get that out there. So uh, YouTube's a big mission of mine to continue to push my YouTube and content. Uh, and that's it, man. That's kind of the core of it is content creating and spreading as much truth as I can. I like the uh, I like the Ellen DeGeneres idea, and you know that's that's clearly a uh, a surmountable kind of goal. If you look at someone like Marisa Ender, yeah. right? She got yeah. she got taken onto the Ellen Show to to do her crazy pull ups, which was super cool to see. And yeah. 
you know, Maurice is an awesome person. So, I, you know, I was incredibly happy for her to see that she got that. But yeah, I think my boy, uh, John, Obese to Beast was on Ellen DeGeneres. Um, yeah, it's just cool. Uh, she likes to dance. I like to dance. I don't know. We'll make it happen. I feel like I feel like you would be a perfect uh, sidekick on that show, too. Like just just generally. Dude, that would be a dream come true. That would be amazing. Just sit on the couch next to her. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. <laughs> Those shows are so funny because it's like the Conan O'Brien show, and he's got this fancy desk, and then there's got like three seats or a couch, yeah. and he has a co-host, but that guy doesn't get to be in frame unless like every <laughs> five minutes when he gets to say something to go like this. And then otherwise, he's totally off frame like he's a nobody. That will be me. I'm in. It's the life of the co-host. Uh, I'll take that salary any day. Uh, yeah, it would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Pick so me. we had a ton uh, of questions come in um, and, and looking over them, a lot of them were about powerlifting and programming and stuff like that. Um, some more generalized stuff. Hanny, did you want to pick a place to start on that or did you have a um, an ordering? Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of I kind of put these into more just kind of topic sections. So there, there's a, a lot of general questions here relating to training and exercise selection and frequency and volume, etc. So we'll probably spend the majority of the time talking about that. Um, so we'll kind of just open up there and I'll, I'll just throw these questions out. Um, whoever wants to jump in and answer them can. Um, I think a couple of these are, are person specific and I'll point those out. But other, other than that, uh, I'll we'll just kind of roll with it. So, cool. uh, uh, appropriately, uh, the first question, you know, what, what are some tips that you would give for someone just getting into powerlifting? And I think we can all have a little bit of input on this because we all probably have a little bit of different insight. So maybe we'll start with you, Mike. What do, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I always suggest people to get coaching or instruction uh, just because uh, it can be dangerous. Uh, and I'm a big fan of uh, quote unquote accelerated learning. So. Uh, if you can get around an expert, you can get eyes on you. Obviously, there's a financial uh, commitment to that. Uh, beyond that, I uh, try to dive in. So YouTube, podcasts, whatever, try to learn. Um, and then it's uh, you know more applicable is always focus on technique. Uh, very cliche, leave your ego out the door. Uh, but there's tons of little programs out there that uh, people follow and make a lot of progress with, starting strength, blah, 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 blah. Um, but – Normally, just try to learn as much as you can on the topic uh, and just begin. So don't let the learning uh, paralyze you either. Yeah. Uh, I'll chime in with one. Try not to, to do what all of the top people are doing uh, because what works for them, assuredly, as, as you're just getting to powerlifting, is not going to be the best fit for you. Um, and then try not to get number focused with what other people are doing and just you know be happy with your progress as you progress. Uh, and just continue putting one foot in front of the other. Sounds so easy, but it's so hard, you know? Yeah. I've been, I've been into this thing a long time, uh, and I still see Bryce's deadlifts on Instagram and get pissed off, you know? Like, <laughs> so, it just happens. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, just, it, that just makes you part of the world, Mike. That's, that's uh, It's true. Is. It's true. It's true. You're human, but, uh, you know, it, it, it is uh, human nature to be a little competitive, but 100% Bryce is right. You know, don't, don't pull 400 and already look for your 550 pull – uh, just make a little bit of progress, small changes over a long period of time. Yep. That, that's my that's my favorite novice powerlifter thing. Uh, just pulled 405, can't wait for 480. Like 500 right around the corner. Yeah. Uh, 500 is not right around the corner. Or maybe it is. Some, for some people, you know, they, they just make the progress that fast. But, it, you know, more often than not, that is not the case. Um, I think uh, a small piece that I would throw out there, and this is actually relevant because it's a conversation I was having yesterday. Uh, a lot of people kind of hold off on getting into powerlifting because they have this idea in their head of being strong enough to compete. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't disagree with with that idea more. Just inherent with kind of what powerlifting is and how how the community of powerlifting is. It's it's very different from most other sports because you know it's it's kind of cliche to say it's it's you versus you, but it's. In, in a way it is, but you know when you get into the top levels, it's there's absolutely competition for placing. But there's you, I, I haven't really experienced a lot of communities that are quite so supportive of each other. You know, you can you can talk to any powerlifter, and almost always they'll be willing to help you, be it with some technique feedback or questions about programming or just in general. There, people are very helpful. They're very friendly. In general, again, obviously, there's exceptions to the rule on both ends of the spectrum. You're going to find people like Mike that are way too friendly, and dicks. you're going to you're gonna... dicks out there. <laughs> and then on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to find some serious dicks. And so, it, you you kind of want to go with that happy medium, and and don't make your judgment of of the sport as a whole based on the one. 
but point being like mike said you should just dive in you know go go for it full steam um and i think you'll find that you kind of get hooked on it faster than you might think i just wanted to share a resource for that as well uh bryce krachik who's a, a really talented lifter up in canada he has a, a youtube channel uh Cal- calgary barbell and he started a, a series recently called so you want to be a power lifter it's a really good series for first time lifters or someone who's thinking about doing a meet or just wants to learn more about powerlifting. The the videos have a nice mix of humor. They're really well edited. So it's, it's a really good resource if you're looking to get into the sport. Yeah, fuck that guy. He's strong too. <laughs> he is. Yeah, did you guys see is that 800-pound pole? Is he competing pole? this weekend? Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know. He is yeah, strong. Yeah, I think he is. Yeah. Best of the West or something competition. Best it's like 10 West. people. Dude, he just hit the, <laughs> the cleanest 800 uh, I know. I've ever seen. It's crazy. Uh, and then he like beautiful. squats six hundred, like a uh, little comeback PR. I'm like, fuck <laughs> you, bro. That's like my, that's like my steroid PR. Yeah. <laughs> Not that He's we're saying <laughs> Mike has one of those PRs. <laughs> no, but I will one day. <laughs> yeah. Fair TRT. enough. When, when, TRT when we're when we're all old and wrinkly. <laughs> um, so uh, another another good question that someone asked. Uh, I kind of lost the name that asked it, so I'll just jump into it. It's uh, resources. Eric, you provided one already, but let's say books or articles, kind of print resources that you, that you think are ideal for novices who want to learn about programming and training. I'll start with my favorite. Um, generally, I, I find that I have some points where I disagree with Mark Ripito, um, mostly related to technique, but the his book practical programming for strength training is is a really exceptional place to start if you know nothing about programming that that really has a nice breakdown and a nice explanation of periodization and kind of how how you can create your own training plan and it's a good jumping board it was the first thing that i ever read on on kind of training and how to create training programs and i find found that i was able to really understand a lot of the terms and a lot of what goes into it without having to get more mm-hmm. and so i think that's a great place to start Dude, I'm the worst at this because I'm so bad at reading. Uh, I haven't read a book since high school. But uh, in my defense, I've been lucky enough to uh, rub elbows with people like you three, people like Chad Wesley Smith, Ed Cohen. Uh, the list goes on. Brian Shaw. And so uh, one, kind of going back to the last conversation, is like ask questions, meet people, network. Uh, books are great, uh, but getting knowledge from people are awesome also. And we're lucky enough that our sport's still pretty niche where – it's not like asking Michael Jordan about his jump shot. You, you can get some answers from really legit coaches. There's also really le- legit coaches uh, that may not even have Instagram and things of that nature that you can you can meet in your city. Uh, number two, I would always say uh, videos too. Although I've never uh, read Ripto, I've watched every like live seminar or video or lecture I could find. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. No books for me. So the, not the even cool thing- green eggs and ham. I read uh, I, the, the only tips, real training. Tips. Yeah, the, my training books are bad, dude. I, I went straight to super training uh, because I heard the story of why super training was super training. Um, and I already had a decent knowledge of programming training before that. But that, I mean, talk about wordy and way over my uh, third grade reading knowledge. Uh, and then, two, I read a lot of Louis Simmons stuff uh, just because when I was joining super training, I knew it was a West Side style gym. And I was like, I better know my shit before I go in there. But just the just to add in to what Mike said there, for clarity, when he says he went straight to super training, he means the book. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which oh. is Mel Sif. Yeah. yeah, Mel Sif's book, Super Training, which is very dry, like yeah. the driest of dry training books. It's and, a textbook. But the pictures, yeah, it's, though. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> there's some comedic gold the in the pictures. pictures, though. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a great book on training. There's a lot of really valuable information in there, but it's really like trying mm-hmm. to read a calculus textbook That's for, for like. let for leisure so be aware if you if you pick that up it's a tough one leisure. and it's not cheap it's an expensive freaking hunk of piece of paper yeah yeah michael so, sell you his though there you go so thankfully, yeah. thankfully now there's a lot of resources that you can find online um either through websites that are just like essentially a compendium of articles that are all available for free if you're into that kind of thing um and also a ton of really quality eBooks. You just don't get it printed and, and get it, you know, in front of you unless you go out and get it printed, of course. But um, shout out to uh, my coach and the people he worked with. Eric Helms put together um, two good eBooks. One called the uh, Muscle and Strength uh, Pyramids, and one called the Nutrition and Something Pyramids. Um, both of those were really readable, um, well put together. 
and had a ton of great info for um, for novices. Yep. Yeah, on top of the ones you guys mentioned, I would say if you want to learn more about auto regulation, the RTS manual by Mark, Mike Tuchur is good. Um, I know Mike Isretel did a good book on just general prin principles of strength training, which can be useful. But I think beyond just books, I think seminars can be really useful as well because you get to hear the coach or athlete or whoever it may be talk about how they apply some of those concepts and some of the nuances in their training. And I think it gives you a different perspective of, of how those principles are used. Another big uh, tip I got uh, kind of along the lines of seminar, again, there's a financial commitment, but getting a coach uh, is some of the best learning experiences I've ever had. Uh, Cause if you can get a coach, read the program, do the workouts and follow blindly, or you could try to read in and, and understand why he's doing certain things or she is doing certain things uh, for you or your goals or your lift. Uh, and you can learn a ton. You know, I, I learned arguably the most ever just working six months with Jeremy Hamilton. Uh, and and we, had, we communicated a good amount, but mostly just me seeing why and thinking why and how he does things. Uh, you can go a long way. Absolutely. If you just kind of think critically about why you're doing the things that you're doing and why, you know, if you note that you tell your coach you're feeling kind of crappy this week and you observe how he makes training changes in subsequent weeks, yeah. there's something to be learned from that. 100%. Uh, uh, obviously, coaching isn't isn't the only way to learn, but it's definitely how I think all of us learned to get into coaching. Yeah, I think I think it is the best. I honestly do. Or, or uh, articles and programs, like Bryce kind of said, like you could go find, uh, you know, follow Wendler's five three one uh, and learn something basic from it. Uh, and you can get really strong with some basics. You know, you don't have to understand one hundred percent auto regulation, one hundred percent percentages per reps for this and that, and get very freaking strong and and stay injury free. Absolutely. So on to the, uh, the next question. I think, Eric, I'm going to toss this one at you. Uh, how many sets and reps and just in general, how much volume uh, is a good starting point for programming in each phase uh, when we're talking about accumulation, intensification and peaking? And how much should it increase or decrease during, for example, a 12 week cycle? And uh, how would you find your sweet spot on volume? This seems like three separate questions, but it's it, I can I can kind of understand it. So I, I think the sets reps volume is maybe a little bit too specific. But how would you find your sweet spot and increase or decrease appropriately in the context of a twelve week cycle? So the answer is exactly one hundred and twenty seven. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's yeah, I did really... one hundred and twenty eight and made mad gains. Yeah, see how long you last doing that, Mike. <laughs> Overreaching bastard. All right, Eric, take it away, man. <laughs> It's uh, it's so individual. It's it's hard to give a specific number as far as that goes. And you can use the context of what you've done previously. So if if you have if you if you did say a twelve week training cycle prior to, to prior to testing, and you did a certain amount of volume, you can use that as context to to think about maybe what you need to improve going forward. So um, if you're not changing any of your lifts or anything like that, maybe just doing an, an additional set or a few extra reps here and there is going to be enough to add volume and get a, a positive training stimulus to make progress. But, um, man, there's there's a lot in that question. Yeah, there um, is. <laughs> well, Eric, as far as, could we, as, far as say, progressing... Like, it's a good idea to, to be doing less than 12 reps, generally speaking, like in terms of rep rep counts. For the for the competition lifts, maybe I think you can exceed that in some of your your isolation work, um, accessory work, stuff like that. But but yeah, I, th I think you probably don't need ex to exceed you know the eight to twelve rep range, and even in a hypertrophy phase for the competition lifts. Um, but as far as progressing through those cycles and working towards peaking, that's going to be really dependent on how you're responding to the training itself and how fatigued you are. So. You can make changes along the way in order to to reduce some fatigue and increase your preparedness for testing. Um, but the amount that you change that along the way is going to be really dependent on how you're responding to the training from week to week. Well, let me ask you this, Eric, just because it's something I'm I'm kind of curious about. Like, as far as accumulation phases go, um, the idea is kind of like adding volume, you know, from the beginning of that to the end to like increase work capacity, like. Does that apply to the sport of powerlifting, you know, compared to like a linear approach where volume drops off as intensity increases? Well, when you're accumulating volume, you're also going to be 
making fitness adaptations and getting better at the lift. So, you know, just because you're not able to express your strength at that time, because you're, you're tired, you've, you know, you've ran through a lot of volume. It doesn't mean that you haven't made improvements. You've, you've made fitness adaptations. It just might take, you know, a temporary reduction in volume in order to show that in order to see how much progress you've actually made. That's a good point. So uh, an interesting point you brought up there with regards to using fatigue to dictate that, Eric. What are some markers that we can use to kind of tell how fatigued we are in the course of training? Not strictly limited to how you're feeling in the gym, but obviously that too. I think probably the best quantifiable markers are, are just using auto regulation from a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I was talking about this on, on Facebook the other day we had a chat about like what intensity ranges you, you should strive to be in and when you know that you're pushing too hard and when you're not. Um, I would say generally speaking, the majority of your volume can probably fall in the six to eight RPE range, something that's, that's manageable and not, not pushing too hard, but it doesn't have to be everything. So if you're doing like a five by five and your first set's a six and your last an eight, last is an eight, that's, that's a manageable working range. But if your first set is a eight and a half or a nine and you're, you're failing towards the end of it, then you're probably at your limit for that intensity range. Um, and then if you're doing, if you're at a six on your first set and then you're at a 10 by the end of your sets, you're probably doing more volume than you need to. Going so uh, a little uh, off topic, but uh, I'm pretty familiar with RPE. Don't use it that often as an athlete. Uh, sprinkle it in as a coach. Uh, example, I'm pretty damn fatigued right now. My training volume overall is crazy high. I've begun weightlifting and cardio. I'm in a calorie deficit, uh, and I kept my frequency of my normal training pretty high. So literally training sessions like 10 a week if you throw everything together. Uh, squatted, I'm working, uh, training with Alan Thrall on Mondays right now, and Alan's on a, uh, with a starting strength coach who fully uses RPE. Uh, and Alan's obviously eating a bunch of food and peaking for a meet. Uh, so I'm just hopping in randomly on that workout, just going for it because it's RPE. So I should be able to just keep up, right? Uh, I squatted. Uh, we we're supposed to have like RPE 9 uh, single. I worked up to like 485. Uh, in my head, it felt like a 10. Feedback from the world, uh, they would say it's a 6. Uh, video feedback of myself knowing myself, I'd say it's an 8 or 9. Rate of perceived exertion is perception, which should be me. Uh, but I see a lot of coaches, uh, a lot of people in the gym, Instagram or not, uh, giving like, oh, good squat, Bryce, that looked like a seven. Well, well, my perception doesn't matter in this situation because then it, it, it just uh, is not a piece of the equation. How do you guys deal with that as athletes and coach, if some of that made sense? That's actually a, uh, a great question. I think being consistent with whichever system you use to rate it is important. So if you're going to use video to rate your RPEs, if you're going to watch your lifts and use video, then always record your lifts and always judge your RPE using the video. If you're going to do it internally, always do it internally. Always kind of judge it based on how you feel about it. However, there are times when your body's going to lie to you a little bit, yeah. uh, like what you're going through now, where you're feeling really fatigued, where things just feel awful. You're capable of more, but basically, you know, you're, you're hitting the red line when it comes to how hard you're pressing the gas and it just, you're putting a lot of, a lot of stress on a system that's already running pretty hot. And so in times like that, a combination of variables. Uh, I, I think how you feel internally and w how you feel it looks on video are the two the two most important and most useful. Other people are always going to watch and be like, "Oh, pff, that looks super easy," yeah. and then you can put five pounds on and miss. And so it's it's just inherent. You know, everyone's RPEs look a little bit different. There are people who have a broad range of what is a nine. They can grind at a range of like thirty pounds on a single, whereas other people it's fast until a, until it's a miss. And so. A, a firm understanding of yourself or someone who you train with all the time and knows what, what your training looks like is important. And I think either one of those are going to work really well. Mike, I, I totally agree with you, by the way. Like almost always for me, things feel slower than they look. Uh, and you just kind of have to be okay with that because, yeah, it's it's it can throw you for a loop the first few times. Like you're like, God, that felt like I could not have completed a single another rep. Uh, yeah. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, what the shit was I talking about? That looks fine. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, you and I talked a little bit, Bryce, too, and you said uh, a lot of times Eric will just prescribe uh, loads for you. Like you have three sets of five at 400 to 410 or something, and, and your auto regulation lies in that range. Uh, and that's typically how I uh, prescribe workouts and program. Um, I guess another question would be uh, if I do o- only internal uh, RPE or my own video, how do you guys as coaches or athletes deal with people uh, – being a, like a sandbagger or a pussy or otherwise, because uh, like I know for me, I'd probably just be a pussy the whole time. Like same with that that, that same example. I squatted 495 for one. Uh, I was like, no freaking way. Like my, I felt like my face was exploding. Yeah. Uh, but the video looked like it, it was 80%, uh, which it kind of is. But <laughs> beside the point, um, how do you deal with the, the individual athlete making that call on the day since you guys obviously can't text every single athlete or or – be in person with every single athlete? This is a great Eric question. <laughs> yeah, I could take that. Um, I think more commonly the the problem that we have is, is somebody who's assigned a, a six or a seven and turns it into a, a, a max day. Yeah, ego driven. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, if somebody's undershooting, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a problem. You can, if there's somebody that shows a pattern of that, you can intentionally give them a little bit higher RPs than you would normally give to somebody. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think it's really an issue because it gives you a little bit more room to build momentum over the training cycle and you can maybe push them a little bit harder in their back off work or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, usually the more it's more of a problem if they're overshooting because that's that's something that kind of kills your momentum and starts bleeding into the next few sessions. You know, if they turn their seven into a nine and a half or a 10, there's going to be a lot more fatigue from that. So the next session when they're deadlifting, they might turn their, their seven into a, a eight or a nine again. And it's just going to, it's going to be a pattern of overshooting. That's, that's hard to get past. Is that a yeah. case where you guys may just uh, hop straight into percentage or give the guy his loads? Sometimes, or, or just assigning maybe lower RPs than you would normally or giving them yeah. a, a more more specific weight range to shoot for yeah or kind just of have a conversation with them like <laughs> i've, I've written chill down, out bro <laughs> yeah i've written down on some people's training approaches like you know a single at seven and then like a note that says no seriously no higher than seven just so that they <laughs> like they know I'm, I'm talking serious yeah some people it's just you know different people are going to perceive things differently and honestly inflating or deflating the prescribed rpe goes a long way so you know if if someone's a a chronic overshooter and basically picking how much you're going to inflate or deflate it based on how much kind of associated fatigue and overshoot is going to have on that lift so for example a bench press if you have a chronic overshooter on the bench press you can really tolerate you you could tolerate a regular overshoot on a bench press single you could probably I, i know from experience you could you can max your bench press all the time and still make progress. Um, there's high potential for injury there in the shoulder, but ultimately a little bit of extra bench press fatigue and you'll be fine. That, that bleeds off pretty quick. Uh, squat a little bit less so, deadlift a little bit less so. So if you have someone who's always overshooting, you might underprescribe by 0.5 on, on bench, maybe by one full point on squat and maybe by one and a half or two on the deadlift. And essentially you'll account for the lifts and how much they're going to be fatiguing based on overshooting. And so, so that just, way... Uh adjust that entire program like if if you you may just take away even frequency or total volume if they're uh i guess overshooting all the time yeah yeah i mean so we're 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 always monitoring different variables like last set rpes and general fatigue how well they slept how much how much they want to train and things like that and in monitoring those those are some of kind of the external factors you can look at that are telling you how fatigued you are you know if you get to the point where you sleep like a dead person every night and you're not motivated to train at all and all of your lifts feel super slow you've probably been training a little hard or a little bit too hard and, and yeah exactly and so we we've all absolutely been there but that's you know that's part of the training cycle there are periods where you're going to feel that that way your case is a little bit extreme because you're you know you're kind of dipping your toe into many different pools at the same crossfit time. games but, yeah exactly <laughs> i don't nice. know if you guys know this but uh, there's there's a reason mike is with reebok uh I'll try it. <laughs> no but it's you know there's there's only to be to be to use kind of an older thought about it it's it's hard to be really good at a bunch of things at the same time so at least in your case it's about learning the different things but for for powerlifting specifically just managing fatigue is probably the biggest thing that we do as coaches yeah 100 percent. And, and the one thing is to look at patterns so you know if you occasionally overshoot or undershoot like that's not even something to blink twice about but if you notice a pattern of consistently overshooting or undershooting well then we can start making some adjustments Okay, so on to the next question here. Um, 
talking about frequency, uh, a couple different questions here that can be combined into one. Uh, how, how would we know when it's time to increase frequency in order to get through a plateau? And specifically, um, what kind of results have we seen from increasing frequency on the bench press? And, you know, over what kind of time frame, what kind of progress can you expect if, if it's going to be a positive adaptation there? So some research shows that in volume equated approaches, uh, increasing the frequency allows for larger amounts of strength gain. Um, there was a, a Norwegian study that's been validated, I think, a, a second time showing that between three and six days a week, uh, volume equated approaches showed more progress, uh, significantly more on the higher frequency approach for squat and bench, I think. Um, that said, I, we have to deal with athletes being real humans, having schedules and work and stuff like that. So, you know, this isn't just to say like, hey, increase your frequency as high as you can take it. Um, and I think each of the three lifts kind of have separate parameters on how much frequency they can take based on how readily we can recover from those and, and what you're doing in each individual session. So it's important to note that volume, intensity, and frequency are, are related and a change in one can necessarily mean a change in the other. Uh, as, as you go forward. So that's that's at least uh, a part of it, and I'll let you guys kind of continue from there. I think just uh, one thing you said, too, is I think it's a coaching style on how people work uh, where some coaches will uh, kind of increase volume and frequency to the max and then tone back by uh, feedback or injury where others may slowly ramp up uh, and it's just a different style right where all right buddy we're brand new together we're going to bench once a week uh, make as much progress as we can continue etc because like you said uh, there is a lot of many factors lifestyle food uh, experience strength levels uh, and efficiency of the lift uh, so once i guess optimal for frequency number one i kind of look at uh, general strength uh, experience and then also efficiency per lift which uh, I'm sure you guys probably look at a lot and talk about, but I don't hear a lot of people talk about it. Guys are, uh, you know, all over the internet. Oh man, I'm squatting five days a week and their squat is absolute trash, uh, bar path all over the place. Don't know what they're doing. Uh, that's just taking steps backward in my opinion, because that's, uh, obviously every deviation from a perfect like lift, uh, the more it's going to take to recover from. If you hit five sets of five every single day and your technique is perfect at the same load or the bar path deviates, uh, you're going to have a tougher time recovering. So uh, if you can get more quality reps, then sure, it's maybe time to, to up that frequency or volume. Um, and there's obviously a line of, of walking where not every lift is going to be perfect. But Yeah, you yeah. said some important things there, Mike. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, one, one of the reasons I like to increase frequency is to get – a little bit more volume, but also to increase the quality of the sets, which I think is important. So let's say we have somebody who's doing two two times a week benching with eight sets a day. They're, they're trying to get a lot of volume in. If we spread that out to three times a week with six sets, you're getting in more volume, and those six sets are probably going to be higher quality than the eight sets on those two days. Yeah, I think that's the key driver to everything because you're not only working, you're going to be more powerful on those. They're going to be cleaner, so you're going to be recover more. You're going to have more attention and energy to uh, technique itself so you can improve yeah. uh, <laughs> as well as obviously handling more volume, which is a main driver. Yeah, the, the more sets you do on a given day, it's just inherent that there's probably going to be some quality degradation towards the end there. Yeah, for some reason, people can't uh, understand that, even though it's it's shown in every other sport in the world. Kobe Bryant didn't shoot a thousand free throws on Monday. He show he shot whatever four hundred every single day. Uh, it, it just makes one hundred percent when you're talking golf, basketball, soccer, football, anything. Uh, and once you talk lifting and add load to the equation, some things do change when you add uh, load because it's a little different than shooting a basketball. But a lot of the general principles just they apply. Let me ask you guys this. Um, have you have you ever known any coaches or experimented yourself with kind of temporary increases in frequency? So like a shock microcycle or something where normally you're squatting twice a week, but for this six week period, we're going to be squatting four times a week, like, and then purposefully bring it back down. Like, is that a variable that you ever play with? I haven't done it a lot with uh, clients, to be honest, just because most of my clients, not that I work with a ton, but most of them are online, uh, and I just don't feel I have the exact uh, control of the whole situation, but I've done it on myself uh, semi-recently. Uh, I'm a big fan of Max Aeda. Uh, Max Aeda, uh, smart dude, strong dude, 
Uh, and he trained with the Bulgarian god himself. So I just love hearing those stories. Some are funny. And uh, number one, that squat every day is the most popular thing on the internet. And Max Ayeda lived it. Uh, so I think that's just cool in itself, you know. Uh, and he talked about how he would apply it um, in terms of uh, almost like coming back from an injury, uh, perhaps peaking kind of like the Bulgarians did. Uh, and what I've done with myself is for some reason this year I've gotten super sick uh, about two or three times. Um, and so training's going awesome. Uh, maybe I am overreaching a little bit plus travel and just, you know, my lazy lifestyle, bad sleep, whatever. I get sick, can't squat for four or five days come back and 315 feels like a truck, uh, I'll just squat every day for like uh, 12 to 20 days in a row uh, and feel right back, if not beyond where I was before. Uh, and then go back to my regular frequency of, you know, my general frequency is like three times a week. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what you're saying is that, you know, it's not only strength, you know, in recovering from sickness, it's, it's riding a bicycle, you know, it's kind of remembering how to squat. So you're just kind of catching up a lot faster. It's like, you know, waiting to the last minute and then doing a bunch of homework before turning it in. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's me. Is there, is there any alternative option? Yeah, uh, there is. That's that's all I ever did. Um, back to the back to the specific question. <laughs> so <laughs> we're way left field. <laughs> I know we we are we are out there, guys. Um, <clears throat> so uh, ways to tell when you can increase frequency, though. I think good signs in training, or you know, if you're if you're benching three times a week. And you find that you're recovering really easily and, you know, you never have any aches and pains in shoulder or elbow or wrist and that you're not making the progress that you want. You know, you can try adding more volume, but there's there's a reasonable limit to that. You know, when you start to get up into the eight to ten set range, it starts taking an hour to finish your bench press training. And while some of us can tolerate that in terms of our lifestyles, most people cannot. And so something else to examine, another way to squeeze in more volume, which is going to be your primary driver for progress there is, okay, I'll introduce another day. And then like Eric said, you could go, you know, if you if you think about it as total number of uh, either sets or total number of reps per week, I like to look at it as total reps. The example he gave, it was, you know, eight sets on two days a week versus six sets on three days a week. So that's 16 versus 18 total sets. And so if you were doing six sets on three days a week, you could go to five sets on four days a week. And, you know, you go to 20 versus 18 <clears throat> total sets. And so just so long as ultimately you're reactive to the way your body tolerates that, you know, and start with a little bit. If you're adding a fourth day, start with three really trivial sets, build it in and gradually build up the intensity and the volume of that day. Build it into the scope of your program in such a way that your recovery can tolerate it. And if you find that you're able to deal with it well, then you can start to load that day. And then you can kind of mess with how you have the distribution of intensity and distribution of volume throughout the course of the week. So the when it becomes too much is, you know, if you introduce that day and you find that three weeks in, you're starting to get a little bit of pain in your pack or you're starting to get a little bit of pain in a bicep or an elbow or a wrist and it's coming on that fast and you're still kind of in that trivial intensity range, that extra day of frequency is probably probably the wrong thing for you. And that this this same pattern kind of applies to all the lifts, right? So uh, I often find that even when people are squatting two days a week, a really, really light session with a variation in the middle of the two can actually go a long way towards promoting recovery. Um, I, don't, I don't really like super high frequency deadlifting, but for the most part, the, the general rules are, you know, if you're, if you're not progressing, if you're recovering better than you should, then you could probably tolerate more frequency. So I think some of that uh, answered the previous question uh, about like how much volume to start with or add with or whatever. Uh, start with something stupid. Three sets of five at 60 uh, percent and do that for two weeks and then just go up from there because uh, volume is all relative to what you handled. Uh, and the goal of everything is obviously progress to get stronger and then to find the drivers that make you get stronger, which is volume, frequency, uh, technique, etc., uh, start really stupid and build your way up. And that's my personal way. As I mentioned, some coaches start really high and then pull down when you get injured. Uh, I'd rather lay our way up. And if we waste a week of, of not pushing ourselves, but we're injury free, uh, I'm more for that. Yeah, that's uh, an understated, beautiful thing, being injury free. You don't really value being injury free until you've been injured. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things you really, really take for granted. As much as I try to tell people, it's just, you know, some people, you know, we were all there too. It was always the old crotchety power lifter for, for you, Mike, it might've been Mark who was like, you know, one day you're going to get hurt and yeah. put, you know, shaking their finger at you. And, and we were like, nah, I'm invincible. And then, you know, lo and behold, here we are, we've now all been hurt. Um, 
but it is what it is. It kind of comes with the territory when you're beating up your body like this. So let me see. Kind of a more specific question here. Uh, do you recommend that younger athletes spend an extended period of time focusing on hypertrophy, training in kind of a, a pseudo bodybuilding style or uh, that popular term that we all love to hate, uh, power building, uh, and then kind of focusing on building their muscular size before trying to capitalize on that size to build as much strength as possible. Uh, this specific person is asking because they are being involved in coaching strength on a high school level next year and trying to figure out how to best develop those guys for their long-term potential, which this is a great question because of that. It's not always that you get kind of high school strength coaches asking that question because uh, I can tell you, like my high school, for example, they jumped us right into, uh, we were back squatting twice a week, front squatting twice a week, benching twice a week, cleaning twice a week, snatching twice a week, and had all sorts of accessories built. We were training for four hours a day. It was crazy. Yeah, but, just max effort on everything. Yeah, yeah, it was hella heavy. I mean, we, we got strong as hell, but the guys <laughs> got hurt all the time. Yeah. Um, so for perspective, we had multiple, you know, 600-pound raw squatters coming out of high school. And everybody was there were there were no belts. My my coach like hated powerlifters, and so he was, he uh, he, he just had this crazy strength program where guys are you know touching or well more like fat guy bounce and go. But you know you guys know what I'm talking about that big old sink and heave. Uh, 400 pounds in high school and squatting 600 yeah. and it's craziness. Strong. Yeah, that that progressive strong. adaptation works. You know, regardless of whether we're talking about young kids or or older kids. But the the problem is, are they going to uh, exceed that later in life you know i mean a lot of the studies on early development for uh sport in general shows that burnout increases rates of injury increase when you start pushing things before age 18 and that's definitely something to consider i know resistance training is a little bit different because it's not exactly a sport in and of itself um it, it's it's in all other realms a tool to get you to help with your sport but for us it pretty much is part of your sport um I think that there's a ton of high school kids that end up getting stupid strong um, under under whatever means, but it's kind of like if you just had the right genetics to survive the training instead of like, is this going to raise the largest number of athletes the most, you know, over time? So in terms of younger athletes, like, I think it's about balance. They should be doing other things besides just resistance training and probably a large focus on technique and probably varied movement patterns as well. Um, Eric, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I, I think one of the things that gets lost sometimes is when you're working with younger athletes, one of the biggest things is just keeping them healthy and prepared to compete and play in the sports that they're focused on at that time. You know, they're not going to be competing in, or not necessarily going to be competing in powerlifting. So their training focus doesn't need to center around the three competition lifts. You can get outside the sagittal plane and do, you know, unilateral work. You can do frontal plane type of stuff. You can do a lot of different things to, to help them with their, their agility, um, just a variety of movement and, and keep them healthy. So I think that's number one is <laughs> like uh, building high school athletes. They can get strong so easy. Uh, you don't need to do anything. Uh, I worked with a lot of high school athletes for a long time. Uh, yeah, you give them a glass of milk and they're going to get a PR in the squat. Uh, and, and I never take credit for any athlete don't that I've ever worked secrets, with. But yeah, <laughs> full fat milk uh, with a little bit of trend. And uh, I worked with all these high school athletes and people like, Mike, how'd you get these guys to do this or that? I was like, I didn't do shit. You know, like we'd box squat once a week. Maybe we'd pause squat once a week. We do like just kind of three sets across the board of uh, weights that I would choose to make sure that there's techniques in the, in the range. Uh, and, and an RPE scale, we'd probably sit it at like a seven. Uh, they're never struggling because as soon as they struggle against a squat, their spine's going to hurt and they're not going to be able to shoot a basketball the next day or run a route the next day. Uh, so training for powerlifting and training for a sport already are just so different. Uh, like you guys already mentioned is, is staying injury free and being able to be on the field is number one or court or whatever it is. Um, but number two is also just like uh, soreness. Uh, there's reasons that uh, with a lot of athletes, I would use a trap bar deadlift over a barbell. Um, one, it's easier to teach in my opinion. Uh, maybe there's a little uh, less posterior activation, but we can do other horse shit to figure that out. Uh, whether it's back extensions or something else, but you get less sore, the range of motion's less, they can get work done without me teaching them how to deadlift for two weeks. Uh, we didn't do power cleans, same reason as we could do a, a sloppy power clean 
in a week and maybe bust up our wrist, or we could do a med ball toss uh, with zero instruction. Hey, man, take this heavy ball and throw it as high as you can and get the same triple extension out of it uh, with less soreness uh, in the wrist, traps, and other things so these kids could go on the field tomorrow and play rugby. I saw that uh, Justin Choi is the guy that sent this in. Um, the U.S. Olympic Committee put out a guide on long-term athletic development for um, younger athletes. So if you email me, I will send that to you. Uh, I don't think it's available publicly, but it's just a PDF, and I'll be happy to send that to you. For anyone who wants to email Bryce anything, spam, whatever, it's going to be Bryce at the strengthathlete.com. <laughs> I, I encourage questions. Please don't sign me up for spam. Um, and, and for anyone listening, by the way, I can send out that long-term athletic development guide. Yeah. Uh, he can be reached at Eric at the strength. Athlete. <laughs> <laughs> now to, to build upon what you just said, Mike, actually, um, thoughts are on, uh, on training around injuries. So as an example, and I think this is actually a fun question and we, we've touched on this in a few other podcasts, particularly the one we did with, um, Dr. Quinn Hennock. And I think that's honestly one of the, one of the highlight podcasts we've done. Uh, anyone listening to this, if you haven't listened to that one, I highly recommend it. It's a little bit long but uh, it's got some great info. Uh, but an example here, uh, he says, my lower back prevents me from deadlifting off the floor at the moment, but I believe certain variations of deadlift like snatch grip block pulls, uh, that's a very specific example, but like snatch grip block pulls are doable and that I can still tolerate high volume squats and I'm assuming he means without pain. So how would you train around injuries when you can't perform a specific movement but can strengthen the muscles required in the movement. So, I mean, I, I think this question is kind of inherently answered in the question, you know, like, yeah. I can't deadlift from the floor, but I can pull from blocks. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, pull from blocks. And right. if you can if you can do any kind of reasonable amount of squat volume, you can get away with the tiniest amount of deadlift volume and still make progress on the deadlift. They, they tend to go hand in hand, maybe not an ideal amount of progress, but it's, uh, in my opinion, you can you can definitely drive one with the other. Number one, I always say uh, you got to figure out what the injury is, why it's happening. Uh, and there's a lot of ways, right? It could be mobility. It could be like a real freaking injury, uh, which I think people understand need to understand the difference of being hurt and being injured. Uh, your back may hurt after a deadlift session. That's just kind of the nature of this sport. Uh, if you can't get up or tie your shoe, maybe you need to go to a doctor. Things are a little different between being injured and being hurt. Uh, but figure out why. Technique, programming, mobility, uh, posture during your day. There's 23 other hours in the day that you're doing things probably poorly, even though your back's in a perfect position during your deadlifts. Uh, so figure out those things. And then number two is figure out what you can do, uh, which this guy already did. He can snatch grip from blocks. Go do that, buddy. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, if you can squat really high volume, maybe you don't even need it. Like uh, Handy just said, maybe you don't need to uh, snatch grip from blocks. Maybe you're just high volume squatting for a little while until you figure out what's wrong with your back, and then you can uh, sh slowly work back into some uh, from the ground deadlifts. I will say I would that... definitely oh, go ahead, Andy. Go ahead, Bryce. Uh, oh, I, okay, I, I was just <laughs> I was just gonna add that when possible, uh, keeping the movement pattern in rotation to some degree, even just a couple of reps of deadlifts from blocks a week, is going to be significantly superior to not doing anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of preventing a, a degrading of that that kind of muscle memory of that motion. But um, for the most part, I don't think you necessarily need to do any substantial amount of deadlift volume to progress. Is is what I'm saying in that case. I was just going to add that I haven't had or known of athletes who have had good success with kind of working through the pain, so to speak, where like there's even a little bit of pain on the movement and you just do it anyways. Like it's best to train absolutely pain free, even if that means entire movement substitutions, dropping load, you know, making whatever modifications you need, like instead of just deadlifting at, or doing any type of movement at a three out of 10 or a two out of 10 or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, I couldn't agree with that more. I, I've I've kind of been in that beating your head against the wall phase where you're like, oh man, I've got to meet in six weeks. I can't decrease intensity now. Yes, you can. Because six weeks from now, you're going to feel awful if you, you know, if you don't take a minute to give your body this opportunity to just recover. Yep. Mr. Uh, James Smith, uh, the thinker, uh, when working with Mark a little bit um, on Mark's like elbow injury and things like that, uh, kind of just said what Bryce said, where uh, if anything's kind of a 2 out of 10 on the pain scale, stop. Uh, if it's a 1 out of 10, maybe a 2 out of 10, you might be able to get away with it. Uh, but once you start creeping up with there, you got to figure out uh, something else. True enough. So fun question here that I think kind of 
translates into this, you know, sometimes you really have to step back pretty far to be able to get work in. Let's say you have extreme pain in your hips when you squat, but you could do something like a leg extension. So how do we how do we maximize the way in which leg extensions are going to be able to just get work done? So very specifically, Eric, I think this is a good question for you. Um, how would you use something like occlusion training? Uh, you could talk about in the case of injury or specifically for hypertrophy. I guess I'll start a little bit from the previous question. Um, if you're trying to work around something that affects one of the competition lifts, I would first start to try to find something that's as close to that lift as possible. You know, like like Hanny said, you want to try to keep that that movement pattern ingrained. So if you can go from, if you're not able to pull from the floor with a conventional deadlift, but you can do a block pull or a trap bar deadlift that's somewhat similar, then do that. But if you can't do anything that's even remotely similar to that, then we're probably going to be looking at more targeting the the muscle groups involved with more isolation type of stuff. So if you can't deadlift, but maybe you can do hip thrusts or hamstring curls or anything, you know, uh, GHR or whatever, anything to at least stimulate those those muscles involved with deadlifting um, is going to be useful. If it's uh, something where you're really limited on what you're able to do then that's a situation where maybe occluded training can be beneficial so like say with squatting for example if you can't overload on squats because of knee pain or, or some issue that's going on maybe some type of occluded leg work can be useful in that case because it's it's going to give you some type of training stimulus without the the same mechanical stress that you would get with the overload on your back yeah, I, I think in the case of occlusion, generally it's it's like a bottom tier substitution because you're at absolute minimum load, and it can be a good way to kind of fill in volume and get more muscle damage with less less actual weight on the on the whatever system you're using. But it's so far removed from what from the movements we're actually trying to train. This is kind of just a, a keeping yourself reasonably from shrinking is is kind of what we're trying to accomplish there more specifically for hypertrophy what are your thoughts on it eric i think in most cases unless you're working around something that like like joint pain or something like that i think in most cases you're probably better off just doing the the regular lift itself um but like i said if you're working around say elbow pain or knee pain then maybe an included curl or an included leg extension or something like that can be useful because it's going to be less uh, less loading on the joint, but you can get a, a fairly similar training stimulus from it. Plus, who doesn't love a good pump, right? Yeah, it's great for Instagram. <laughs> yeah, it's great for the gram. That's why you always see those photos with all the all the veins going down the arms. These guys are occlu occluded in their sleeve. And they're just not telling Occlusion you. hurts like hell. I don't know if you guys have ever wrapped like a voodoo floss or like uh, a wristband or a knee wrap around the top of your arm or the top of your leg, but that's way uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of it's kind of like a a cock ring for a, for your bicep, basically. Just like it. <laughs> can we? Can that be the title of this podcast? <laughs> cock rings and Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> Dude, that'll get some attention. <laughs> Clickbait for sure. Man. Um, if you are gonna do it, they have um, like what? little oh, personal tournaments. Cock rings. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm talking about. Uh, if you are going to use a, a occlusion training, then they have uh, little tourniquets that you can get on Amazon that are easily self-adjusted, and it's a couple bucks. Yeah, those are, those actually work really well. It's it's like a kind of like a seatbelt tightening system that you can just kind of crank down. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so talking about weekly structure a little more, uh, what are your guys' thoughts on training the main lifts together versus having? separate days uh so w with you know the individual lifts and their accessories so for example uh a squat day with variations a bench day with variations and accessories a deadlift day etc or combining those and having you know a squat and deadlift day and a bench day or however you might structure that through a week got right it before this uh podcast i uh did a voiceover rant on this exact topic uh for my youtube uh basically i think it all stems from your goals um I think the term split and body part split obviously is from the early years of bodybuilding where you have an arm day, a back day, shoulder day, whereas strength athletes in specific power lifters, typically we have a frequency of lifts and a certain amount of work we have to get done and we structure it in seven days because that's how our society and moon and the Aztecs work. And then we fit those in however it works. Uh, if you have a 
13 hour uh, work day, Tuesday, Thursday, then you're not lifting those days and you're going to have to layer in your three bench days elsewhere. Uh, I've trained both ways and I think both ways can obviously work. Um, I, I guess the downside uh, is that on competition day, you have to squat bench and dead on the same. Uh, so training that at some point may not be a bad idea. Uh, but uh, there's many a people that have smashed many a weights having a squat day, a bench day, and a deadlift day. Uh, Ed Cohn being kind of uh, first to come to mind, who has smashed many a weight, and as far as I know, he didn't do any of them on the same day. So, yeah, that's some awesome points there. Uh, I think it depends a little bit on your frequency. So if, if you want to bench four days a week, you're going to have a hard time finding a day of training where you're not benching, you know, just because of how much frequency you decided to put in your own training. Um, Eric and I differ on this a little bit. I like to separate squatting and deadlifting where possible, uh, unless, you know, the frequency ends up in such a way that you have to squat and deadlift on the same day. Eric, I think you like to consolidate fatigue a little bit and you can explain that too. Yeah, I, I think there's some value to having a few of the competition lifts on the same day. It doesn't need to be something where you're doing full squat bench deadlift sessions because in, in most cases that's just going to be a super long session and you, you, you don't really need to plan your week around something like that. But I do think there's some value in understanding how you feel going into a fatigued bench or a fatigued deadlift from a challenging squat session. It gives you just a more realistic picture of what you're going to be capable of on, on meet day. So, you know, sometimes people will notice that maybe their bench after a really challenging squat day is, you know, 5% less than what it would be if they were to go in fresh and just bench first. Um, so I think it just helps to give you um, a little bit of exposure to the, the fatigue that you might feel on a meet day. Have you ever, I, I agree with. Have you ever changed the temp selection because you found out that someone's bench fatigues more like that? Like... How does that play out in, in reality? I would usually structure it so that their heavy squat and bench day is the same day so that we get a, so like say they're testing their openers on, on a Friday or something like that. On that Friday, we're going to see how their bench looks after a heavy single on squat. And it gives us just a good idea of how that affects it. But do you have to do that um, for whole training cycles? No, no, no. Okay. I'm definitely with Eric on on the idea of combining certain lifts. I find that combining significant sessions of squat and deadlift is hard, but I, I consider it an essential component of almost any program to have benching after squatting on some day in some capacity. Uh, almost, almost always uh, the heaviest bench day will be after something else, uh, be it a deadlift or a squat, essentially. So you're always taking a little bit of fatigue into your heaviest bench day from, from something. Uh, ultimately, so you're used to the idea of not going into the best day of benching every week feeling great. And because, you know, you're going to you're going to take three heavy squats in a meet. There's potential you're going to miss one of them uh, and, and hopefully not. But you need to be prepared for the fact that you might feel kind of crappy while you're warming up in your bench press. And that needs to be pretty much something that's not going to scare you uh, on, on competition day. You guys uh, mess with uh, I guess it's something I kind of inherently did. And then I, I learned more from uh, my man, Joe Ken Big House, uh, like a tier type system where uh, you may you may squat and bench. Uh, let's say uh, twice a week, and they're both on the same day. Uh, but if it's an off season or there's more accessories, one may be like a bench F emphasis day, and one may be a squat where you would squat, bench, pause, squat, lunges, and then you would uh, squat, bench, close grip, bench, uh, triceps, or something of that nature. Is that something you guys yeah. play with? Absolutely. Yeah, you could do uh, that. It's basically just choosing the movements that you want for that specific day. Yeah, that's Usually, uh, where I go. I think mentally it helps, you know, where they're no like, all right, today is, yes, I have to squat today, but today uh, is my day to push the bench. Today's uh, uh, gives you a little bit more of a, a direct focus, I guess. Sure. Yeah, I, I would choose accessories that kind of go with what you're focusing on that day. So if you're, if it's usually I'll make the accessories match on the volume day. So if you have your higher volume squat day with a heavier bench day, I'll usually pick maybe one heavy bench accessory and then a selection of stuff specifically catering to the lower body. And then the inverse supplying what, you know, before benching, if, if I structure squatting before benching, it's usually not the heaviest day like Eric does, but it's, it's a similar layout where, you know, it's some degree of squatting, maybe three kind of triples, just giving a little stimulus to get some recovery going midweek and then getting into a heavy bench day and then, or a, a high volume bench day. Well, every bench day is a high volume bench day, but, um, getting into a, a bench day and then doing some accessories that are going to cater to that as well. 
Uh, let's see here. These are lots of fun training questions. Um, yeah, this one is super specific and a quick yes, no. Can I back <laughs> squat, deadlift, and front squat on the same day without frying my central nervous system? <laughs> no fucking chance. <laughs> No sarcasm there. That, that answers that. <laughs> You're uh, done for. You'll break and disintegrate. <laughs> Your CNS. Uh-huh. I think CNS is horse shit. Uh, <laughs> why do people talk about uh, CNS so much? Like, I bring this up. I was raised a uh, very strict Catholic. Uh, I don't <laughs> consider myself. Where is this going? Like- <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is great. This Catholic is great. nervous system. Uh, this is great. So, <laughs> uh, this is right up your guys' alley. So, uh, I don't consider myself much of a religious man anymore. I like to consider myself spiritual. But wherever your background is, your beliefs, you understand that. Some people believe we are one piece. Uh, we die, we die. Uh, some people believe that maybe our um, uh, spiritual sense is in our brain uh, or whatever, and then our body is our body. Uh, and then many believe that maybe our spirit, our uh, brain, central nervous system, and then our body are maybe three entities. Uh, and I'm sure there's other beliefs in there that I don't know. But – uh, if our central nervous system gets tired or fatigued or whatever, what's that different than just saying I'm a little bit fucking tired or saying my brain and its roots are a little tired or my spirit spirituality is a little bit tired or my personality is tired or my body is fatigued? And why did people automatically within the last 10 years think that lifting weights fries your CNS of all fucking things? I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start opting for my personality as tired. <laughs> I would appreciate it. You, you look, you're looking mighty a lot like you got a tired personality in those squats there, Vodhorn. Yeah. And you know, you may, you might want to, you might want to let your, let your spirit rest. There's and, my uh, uh, rant for the day. <laughs> <laughs> my personality right. needs a nap. <laughs> the, the only we'll thing I can think of is one. people sometimes have this this sensation that my muscles feel fresh and yet I'm still not performing to the level that I want to. And so they need, they need something to put that feeling to, and they put it to, you know, CNS fatigue or burnout or something like that. When, you know, we're really just talking about like the, um, the fitness fatigue model and kind of how that, that doesn't, you know, that's not to say that when you lift, there's not effects on your nerves or your nervous system or your thoughts and how all of those things integrate. But uh, it, it really is just a misunderstood catch-all term when people just want to say, like, my CNS, my CNS. Yeah, fuck your CNS. <laughs> my Fair <fault>. enough. My, <laughs> there's, a, there's a certain degree of psychological stress, too, when you're going into a session knowing that you're doing, say, three really challenging compound lifts like that. You, you just go in knowing that it's going to suck. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of yeah, my point, besides my rant, that there is some uh, seriousness behind what I say. Rather than saying, well, these exercises or this volume or this program or West Side, West Side burns a raw lifters if you're natural CNS, like that just makes that's, makes zero sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Your CNS you doesn't matter. A little bit more fatigued. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to answer the question, yes, you can back <laughs> squat and deadlift and front squat without destroying your spirit. And you will be able to <laughs> be able to continue. Just ensure that your personality yeah. is well rested, etc. Yep. The Pope uh, allows you to do so. Yes, you've May been given be the so. blessing from Silent Mike Barr the Third. Um, <laughs> that's that, I guess. Uh, so, do you guys think that pushing the deadlift and the squat simultaneously for strength take away from each other? Is there any stock in training one for strength and just maintaining the other? Can I just, uh, I'm going to, for all these future podcasts, I'm just going to create a sign that says it depends and I'm just going to hold it up yeah. like, every damn time. Yeah. You should just have a photo of uh, Eric Helms. Actually, I think that's going to make more sense. He's <laughs> the famous, the famous guy who said, well, I guess you have to know the reference, but that's uh, every time I read Eric's response on anything, it's like a, well, it could be this or yeah. um, it could also be that it might be this. It really depends. It is kind of yeah. like every answer might- he's ever given. My new answer is like, uh, I don't know you as an athlete and I'm not your coach. Like that's one, me uh, jumping out of the way, like I'm not going to write you an entire free program right here, an Instagram direct message. And two, uh, whatever answer I give you could possibly be wrong uh, because I don't have enough factors and then I look like an idiot. Yeah. So that's my way, that's my way out. 
Yeah, you can you can definitely get great answers on all these things uh, at Eric at the Strength Athletic. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it depends on how hard you're pushing one or the other or both, um, and how much like are you doing both on the same day or are you just pushing both over a training cycle? Um, but y you can clearly get stronger at squatting and deadlifting at the same time. That's very very probable and possible. Yeah, I, I feel think... like that was a pretty popular thing about the last three years, maybe four years ago, of having like, uh, oh, I'm going to train all three, but this is like my bench cycle, and this is like my squat. And, and I agree with Bryce where, I mean, Bryce is literally top of the game, and I imagine he's pushing for PRs all three at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's on that, that really special peak a week after the meet program. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this time we're really going to try to do it the week of the competition. <laughs> He's actually going to do a mock meet one week out in the hopes that he performs perfectly. I, yeah, just I seriously thought about doing that for athletes because <laughs> it's consistently the case that a lot of athletes do well the week after a competition. You know what I mean? Even with good I, attempt selection. I think we should do a case study for Bryce Lewis on uh, on a mock competition at some point in the next couple of years. I know I think it would be actually kind of fun to do an inconsequential meet <laughs> yeah. and have you do a mock meet one week out and then actually do the do the meet. Uh, a week later, instead of testing your openers, test all three of your attempts. <laughs> well, this time <laughs> we're sure you're get them. we're dialing back the deadlift, so we're basically bringing things a week back, so that deadlifts feel like they normally have the week after the week of the competition. This time, yeah, something like that can work really well. I've used that with clients before, where we notice their squat feels great a week out, so we just take the whole training approach and yeah. shift it forward a week. Yeah, why not? And Lo and behold, they, they don't hit their opener before the meet, but all of a sudden they feel like absolute lightning on all of their squat attempts. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the easiest adjustments without uh, looking at a 16 or 12 week cycle is just the last two weeks. Like, all right, when did we take our last heavy deadlift? When did we take our last heavy squat? When did we take our last heavy bench? And you move it one day, two days, three days, and you're going to get sometimes no different result, but sometimes uh, some people can really make a big change. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, there's no, there's no magic answer here. There's no. No secret key. It's just it's just a matter of the fact that, you know, sometimes you have to move things around a day or two. Yeah. You can get stronger at squats and deadlifts, little buddy. Go do it. Yeah. Uh, it's for, for training, though, you know, it, you may find that it's hard to do anything at all if you're training the deadlift super hard. It's going to be, you know, if you're super fatigued from deadlift, it, your back's going to hurt while you're benching. You're yeah. going to have a hard time getting any quality squat work in. Whereas you may find that taking a moderate approach on the deadlift while pushing the squat hard is much more sustainable. You'll be able to train them both harder in, in total. You'll probably be able to do more more volume on the deadlift, and you'll be able to train the bench more effectively as well as all of your accessories. Deadlift fatigue is just hard to deal with when it's in high levels. It, you just feel like shit all day long. Word. So at least in my opinion, I would say I would I would almost you know 19 times out of 20 push the squat harder and kind of have the deadlift trail and just build a program that way. Yeah, often I'll, I would just scale them all back. Uh, I think people too push too hard on everything. Uh, you know, yeah. there's there's numerous cases, uh, you know, some maximal training and some way or another being fine. Uh, Kirill Sarachev and bench 670 for four or something is his heaviest in an entire training cycle, comes out and crushes 740. Uh, if you can do that in all three, uh, you allow yourself to stay a little healthier. You can maybe <laughs> accumulate more volume over time. And then you don't have to worry about your goddamn personality and CNS. <laughs> goddamn personalities. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's let's shift a little bit and talk about uh, kind of body weight relating relating to training. So someone asks, what is your opinion on gaining weight to get stronger versus just maintaining and getting stronger? And why would you consider one more effective or superior in the long run? That's a good question for Hanny because he likes to make all his athletes <laughs> obese. <laughs> this is a little bit of a running team joke uh, and I, you know I don't know what the reason is but for some reason I and calories are friendly with my clients we like we, I, it's I don't know if I emanate this to them but so I would say it really depends kind of on where you are in your long term like how long you've been training so a novice who's been training for six months and just getting into powerlifting, regardless of how strong they are, I'm always going to recommend that they spend as much time as possible in a calorie surplus. I'll recommend that for anyone. You know, if you can tolerate getting fatter and you're healthy, 
Like, if you're healthy, you can tolerate gaining weight. You don't mind the body composition change. You don't need to make a weight class to set a record or to win a competition. Then, by all means, you should be gaining weight at some rate. Just because it's going to allow you to be more recoverable in training, you're going to be able to do more quality training. You're going to be able to get away with beating yourself up a little more. You'll you'll be able to tolerate more fatigue before you feel like complete and total dog shit. And so, ultimately, I would say, unless unless you need to make weight for a meet, unless you're trying to set a record, unless you're going to win your class, even if you do need to make weight for a meet, unless you stand to win your class or set a record, you in the first place, I don't think you should be cutting for the meet then in general, uh, with health concerns considered, obviously, I, I think you should probably be in a calorie surplus. It's just going to be a more effective way to train. You're going to be less likely to get injured. Uh, I just, it's anecdotally speaking, you will get stronger faster. Now, if you're uh, a 15 year seasoned competitor, who's, you know, walking around around 10% body fat, but you have world-class lifts, and you find that you're able to get stronger at some some appreciable rate without gaining any weight and you need to stay within kind of shooting distance of your weight class, then you may find that not gaining weight all the time is going to be superior. Uh, we can say one thing pretty conclusively that regularly dieting is absolutely going to be inferior to either maintaining or gaining weight. There is there is no bigger thief of gains for for novices, intermediates, and advanced athletes alike than excessive dieting. Uh, it's going to make you, you're, you're going to be able to train less. You're going to go into your training sessions feeling like crap when you are training. You're going to have to deal with cutting weight into competitions, which can have a tremendously uh, detrimental effect when you actually are going to move those weights. You'll find the things that otherwise should have been very manageable for you are just going to crush you. And so I would say, generally speaking, uh, you know, get as fat as you possibly can until you hate yourself, lose about 10 or 15 pounds from there. And uh, that that might be the ideal weight for you. The old uh, the old adage of gain weight until your deadlift goes down is is, you know, kind of a fun one to think about. Obviously, you know, you don't want <laughs> that you hate yourself, but but it's uh, yeah, I tend to agree uh, with all that. Uh, uh, so many people hop into powerlifting and start worrying about weight classes and junior state semi local records. Uh, rather than thinking like, man, five years from now, maybe I should just try to get strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best way to do that is clearly eating more food uh, than you currently need and training harder than you currently have uh, at the basics of all of this. Uh, you can get into as many X and O's as you want, uh, but if you eat a little bit more food every day and you train a little bit harder every single week with a little bit more weight or reps, uh, you'll generally head the right direction of hopefully your goals of getting into powerlifting, which is lifting more weight. The old progressive overload, uh, <laughs> be it in, in terms of food intake or training. And that's basically yeah. both what you're doing. This yeah. guy or girl is, is talking about like the difference between a maintenance and a surplus, though, for progress. So yeah. when, when you're talking about the difference between those, we're not talking about rates of injury. Uh, and we have to look at what's really driving progress. Well, I mean, there's neural adaptations and then there's increases in muscle mass and Protein, like total amount of protein and overall calories are kind of two contributors to at least creating a, a positive environment for you to be able to make um, muscle gains. Um, strength gains can happen, um, sorry, neurological gains can happen like in a deficit, maintenance or surplus. It, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, I don't think that, you know, we need everyone to be in a surplus all the time. And I don't really think we need that much of a surplus in order to get the type of effects that Hanny is after. Like it could be, you know, a, a super small surplus, especially for um, some ladies who don't want to get as fast as possible or some men or like anyone who doesn't want to get as fast as possible. We can still create that type of environment. Um, there are leverage changes and other stuff that comes up, but um, Hanny, what, what type of surplus are we talking about for athletes? Honestly, very minimal is like you said, all you need is just to kind of be in that environment to be able to maximize the effects of your training. So, you know, someone asked an earlier question about uh, hypertrophy for novice lifters. And, you know, if you just train with a moderate amount of volume on the compound lifts and you're in a caloric surplus state, you'll find that you're able to get bigger and stronger simultaneously without having to, you know, do a bunch of leg extensions and leg curls and, you know, good girl, bad girl machines and all that stuff. And, um, uh, which I love the name of those machines, by the way. Side note. That's um, a scientific name. That's not even yeah. that's not Good even girl, a... bad girls. Personally, I think the good girl is the one where you're pushing it open. And the bad <laughs> yeah. girl is the one where you're I, pushing it closed. Agreed. 
<laughs> um, but uh, so generally, honestly, something something very simple like a hundred calorie, two hundred calorie surplus a day is going to give you a really really slow weight of, rate of weight gain. Uh, assuming you gained no muscle at all, you would need a little bit over a month at a hundred calorie surplus a day to gain a pound. Assuming that your expenditure is exactly the same every day and never goes up, so. One pound a month is a very, very sustainable rate of weight gain. Uh, the amount of muscle you're going to gain with that realistically is going to be just fine. You can gain weight a little faster when you're a little more novice, I think. Um, and then, you know, you just kind of adjust it based on how the results are showing for you personally. By the way, side note, I've I've uh, talked with a few athletes and kind of had just some conversations about the fact that, like, it's a good idea for powerlifters to – learn how to meticulously track for like a year or two just to kind of build that skill and then let it go and track a little bit more freely in terms of not stressing about taking in exactly this amount of carbs, fat, and protein or calories or anything like that. Um, but just to have that tool set so that you can estimate a little bit more freely. What do you guys think about that? I don't think it even needs to be that long. It can just be a couple of weeks of paying close attention to it and then just being more mindful of, you know, making good choices, getting a solid protein intake and stuff like that, and the rest will kind of take care of itself. I kind of agree with that. Uh, going back to people focusing too much maybe on their Wilkes or their weight class or a local federation record in the beginning, rather than just focusing on how do I fit this new hobby or goal into my life, mm -hmm. uh, Rather than like, oh, I'm going to turn into an elite pro athlete two months into learning how to squat, bench, and deadlift. It doesn't uh, happen. And that goes to – yeah, no, I, <laughs> I'm eight years in and I still suck. Uh, uh, so just tracking some kind of food, uh, I agree, is just a good life skill set whether you're an athlete or not. Uh, looking at a nutrition label helps. Um, and then, yeah, fitting in your workouts. But I guess uh, going to the exact question of maintenance uh, versus uh, – uh, calorie surplus I, I just agree that more food regardless of everything uh, regardless of wilkes regardless of health regardless of how you want to look more food's always going to be better uh, besides that uh, kind of diminishing uh, returns on a deadlift especially a conventional which may uh, eventually you may be too fat to deadlift sorry guys it does happen but uh, you will gain more strength you'll have more energy you'll recover and leverages for the squat and bench often uh, are awesome and feel great when you're fat Absolutely, especially the bench press. Yeah, it feels awesome. Uh, belt, uh, I've only lost like 10 pounds. Uh, I guess I've lost like 20 since my start. Uh, I just don't <laughs> even mind double. You know, I was fat, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was thinking like the last three months. I've been dieting for like a decade. I don't even know. Uh, but a belt is so uncomfortable when you're even like semi-skinny. I'm not even skinny yet, and a belt fucking just sucks. I would way rather have like a gut to push into that belt. It feels so good. I will say it feels yeah. bad when you're too big too. There's kind of a sweet uh, spot. I did have a, a, a part when I was about 232, uh, wearing a belt and pulling conventional. Uh, yeah, it was gross. My fupas hit <laughs> things. It was weird. It was I can weird. Uh, I can confirm that I was 232 this Monday. Wore my belt, did some conventional deadlifts Dang. yesterday. How, hey. how painful! So painful. <laughs> scale all, scale uh, one to ten. Was it a three? Three out of ten? Yeah, it's enough it. to quit. Enough to quit. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Uh, we're all uh, about the same height, yeah? Ish? Uh, yeah, more or yeah. less within the yeah, same yeah, four ish. inches. I'm a little short. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> besides a foot. Uh, and and I'll, <laughs> I'd all say uh, we're similar-ish frames. Yeah. Like, no, no four of us are, like, the skinny guy that uh, is meant to fucking run across country. Right, right. Right. So 230 uh, on all of us isn't super fun. <laughs> uh, general uh, general advice with diet though and I, I picked this up from Alberto Nunez a while back people usually fall into one of two categories you're the kind of person where if you don't track your eating you'll gain weight or you're the kind of person where if you don't track your eating you'll lose weight and you know most people fall into one of those two and so you know, if you're the kind of person who, and usually you want the other effect you want yeah. the opposite of what That's you do normally so, here, man. Yeah. exactly so if you're the kind of person who when they don't track their eating, they lose weight. You're naturally in a calorie deficit. Focusing on your protein intake, focusing on making sure you're getting enough calories on the whole is important. Uh, being mindful of what you eat is, I think, becomes a little less important for people like that because they just need to eat more. Whereas someone who is like me, for example, if I don't look after what I'm eating, I will gain weight fast. And so, and that's just because naturally I'm a gluttonous human being and that's kind of how I am. But 
so for me, making mindful choices and, you know, even when I'm going out to eat, picking the foods that have a, a kind of, a, even with a margin for error, it's a lower margin for error. For example, estimating chicken incorrectly is very, very different from estimating high fat ground beef incorrectly. And so, you know, that could be a difference of two to 300 calories. And so just making smart choices like that, making sure you're getting enough protein, making sure you're getting carbohydrates around training, things like that go a long way without having to actually actively track what you're eating. 100%. So with weight loss, would you guys say it's the deficit of calories per day that's more important or the deficit of weekly calories that's more important? Who's, uh, who's stepped on stage? I believe Bryce. I have. I have. I almost, you I have almost did. Yeah. All almost right. did. Handy, you and I are out, bro. We don't even get to answer this. The other two got it. Get it, bodybuilders. <laughs> well, what was it? Is it about the deficit of calories per day or weekly? Weekly, weekly versus daily. Uh, yeah, you can go monthly or yearly. Yeah. Fuck it. There's there's a Helms video on what is a calorie deficit actually. <laughs> really? um, I'm gonna deficit this decade. <laughs> the the thing it's, is that I, we I are actually, hopping in and out of a deficit at multiple times in a day. Even you know, either right after a feeding we're in a slight surplus, right before a feeding we're in a slight deficit. You know, as as you go forward, depending on calorie balance. So you know, ultimately over the longer scales is what we're really looking at, and ultimately. You know, the main thing is, is the scale going down or up? So there's easy ways to adjust things. You can look at calorie deficit per day, but oftentimes it's a good idea, especially in extended calorie deficits, to have a few days per week where you're actually in caloric maintenance to slight surplus, in which case we're looking at the week as a convenient unit of measure. That's not the only thing. Um, for advanced athletes, we're sometimes looking at a 10-day average for weight loss or, or even weight gain, but mostly weight loss, a 14 day average. So kind of depends on where you are, what your goal is. I, uh, was, that helms. I was gonna say it's a similar conversation to training volume or whatever else we wanna yeah, do. Yeah. Uh, you can kind of calculate it how you want, uh, but typically I believe the Aztecs, maybe the Mayans made us a seven day calendar. Uh, and so we just follow that. <laughs> Yeah, your, your long-term average is, is going to be the most important thing. I was actually talking about this with Alberto Nunez recently, um, and we should actually have him on to expand on it a little bit more, but something he's been doing with a lot of his, his athletes recently, and I know for him him himself, is um, having a little bit of a lower deficit during the week and then a little bit more of an extended, maybe a higher refeed for two to three days in a row so that when you come back to training to start the week, you're a little more fresh and a little more recovered and, and ready to, to hit that week of training. <laughs> I'm laughing because he's like trying to science the, the whole like be good during the week and, and just fucking <laughs> yeah, go somewhere. ham on the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that might help too with, with just the sustainability yeah. of it. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. I can't be the only one uh, who who you know has this opinion about Alberto, but fuck that guy when it comes to what he gets to eat when he's dieting. <laughs> yeah, no, that dude's Instagramming like six hundred carbs, and then he's like lost a pound, sad face. Like fuck you, bro. Yeah, yeah, fuck he did his extended his extended like three week diet break, and he was like, oh man, I gained like a pound, or I lost <laughs> a pound. I got leaner in my diet break, guys. Yeah. He was getting lean. He literally, the man was getting lean too fast, yeah, so he had to stop his diet. He was going to be ready too early. My God, how green the grass is on his side of the field, I'll tell you. True. Son of a bitch. <laughs> so to answer the question, uh, definitely the larger average is something you want to look at. Daily deficit is kind of an easy way to, to look at it. But, you know, if you have a day where you're going out to dinner with some with some friends or with family, it's your birthday, you have an event you want to go to, it's your 21st and you're in the middle of bodybuilding prep – you know, you don't get to relive those days. You don't you don't get to relive, you know, your your mom's 50th birthday. You don't get to relive your 21st, your anniversary with your girlfriend. Go out, eat a fucking slice of cake, man. You're going to be fine. And you can just make up for that with an extra 50 calorie deficit for the next 5 days and boom, you've eat, you've you've made up for the balance with your slice of cake. A very small slice of cake in this case, but it it's just, you know, a it's bite. all about the average. You get a Be bite. <laughs> yeah, you can have fucking bite of cake. But the extremes in any case are bad. Um, so that's, before a, we get that's especially true in powerlifting too because the there's not as much of an impending deadline as you'd have in bodybuilding where it's it's more a little more crucial to to stay on point and not not go off track with your diet. But with powerlifting you can be a little bit more flexible and there's there's adjustments you can make along the way in order to make weight if you if you go off track a little bit. On the same Absolutely. topic, I th I think a lot of people limit themselves on like 
extracurricular exercise as well. You know, like going out to play basketball with your homies or like going out for a hike or something like that. You know, a lot of people will forego that stuff uh, for the sake of their training, you know, and miss out on some, some good experiences, myself included. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, all that is just learning experience and turning into perspective on yourself and, and, and understanding your priorities and understanding yourself as an athlete. Where me playing basketball uh, right now, awesome. I could do it. If I'm eight weeks into a meet prep and I'm really into this meet, uh, then I'm just going to ditch it. You know, and that's just sadly a personal call, but I agree with Bryce. Uh, and, and if you do it regularly, I think it's a good thing, you know, going into some GPP here and there in your off season, it's not a big deal. If you play basketball once a week, it just becomes the new kind of norm of, of fatigue or fitness. Yeah. Just pick your battles, you know, and where, where and when to choose those. And you may find that if you have habits like that that you do during the, mo the majority of your year, that removing something simple like your weekly basketball game can contribute a lot yep. to recovering and having a really good meat peak. Yeah. And so just a simple way to kind of yep. sneak in. Uh, those are what I call sneaky recovery methods. Taking away little things that you do yeah. on a regular basis can go a tremendously long way. I agree. Uh, let's see here. A couple more questions. And we'll wrap it up. Uh, this one I thought you would be uh, a good one for, Bryce. This is very much right up your alley. Um, and he literally says this question is a little bit different right at the beginning. Um, I'm sure you guys are getting used to these, so I hope you like it. Uh, what do you guys think it means to be strong in terms of uh, mentally, spiritually, well, emotionally, or physically? Got it. Um, well, I think that strong is a word that we can apply to tons of different situations. So I don't think there's one way to be strong. So it's, it's kind of like, how do you view strength? You know, strength could mean overcoming adversity. Strength could mean physically being able to, you know, perform some tasks, but you know, in powerlifting, like we're strong in a very dumb, very specialized way. Like we can pick up a specific object in three very specific ways and that's it you know <laughs> a human manufactured object <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah so yeah strength strength uh really depends on on how we're looking at it uh you know i think like overcoming adversity is a big one it, it could mean how you approach even mundane daily tasks so uh that's definitely a different question and i think it does mean something different to to everyone I think you can you can look at Huck Finn Barbell's Instagram for lots of examples of strength. Um, you know, 400 pound deadlifts on ice skates and dude, <laughs> some of his stuff I really am impressed by. I think he yeah, did 225 or 315 on the step mill. Yeah, I saw <laughs> that one. Some yeah, yeah, things I've ever seen. Is what that yeah, is is that Juji Mufu? Is it the same guy? No, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, uh, so they do Tom similar Finn. things, except Tom Finn literally uh, before some of his antics and before uh, he hurt his pec. He was probably he's top three, two twenty in the world. Uh, he he if he somehow put his head together and stopped drinking so much beer, uh, he could have taken down Dan Green. Damn. Uh, but now he's he's chose more uh, fun things to do. Got it. Yeah, like the guy would you know smash a beer can on his head, light himself on fire, and squat four hundred five <laughs> for ten. Like he's it's just just funny stuff. But to add to that question, you know, like Bryce said, there's a lot of different ways to to show strength in your life and kind of just the way you and it depends on how you define strength individually like some people would define that as kind of you know the the hammer versus the nail analogy or you know maybe you approach everything in a very aggressive manner or maybe you, you think it's much stronger to be very more cool and collected with everything it's that's a tough question to answer and that's kind of actually a really deep question so it's you know i, I don't think there's a simple answer for that for us for our for our perspective it is how much weight can we lift in our on our bars that are made for human lifting and actually demonstrate nothing about how practically strong we are. Sad and true. I like to think of it more as the pursuit. I mean, it's easy to quantify strength in, in our realm of powerlifting, but um, I, I spent six years working in a, a rehab setting with people with spinal cord injuries, and those are some of the strongest people that I've seen. You know, They'll spend years just trying to get to the point where they can feed themselves or take a step or whatever it may be. And that's strength to me, too. It's just a different kind. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah. Uh, for me, it's kind of a combo. But what both you guys said, uh, you know, the, 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 the strength internally to kind of endure, uh, and that could be anything, uh, uh, something as extreme as an injury of that nature or a disease of that nature, or, or something simple as like, I'm going to deadlift every Monday for the next 10 years. Uh, that seems stupid, but to me, that shows real discipline and strength on the inside. Uh, and then to me personally, it's just about doing it with a positive nature. 
Uh, there's so much negativity in this world. There's so much bad in this world. And probably much like those patients you dealt with, they wouldn't strive or they wouldn't take that journey if it was negative. If they were negative about themselves or negative about the situation, like, oh, I suck. I can't do this. I can't do that. You're not going to get anywhere. So having a positive mind and, and hopefully positively, in fact, seeing your own environment and others around you, uh, I think shows uh, true strength. Fortitude Absolutely. is a good word for that. Uh, so last but not least, uh, Walker Bradshaw uh, left this as a as a comment in so many places, and this is this is kind of the argument of the internet right now. And so we'll we'll kind of get everyone's opinion on this. Uh, does pineapple belong on pizza? No, fuck that. I'm with Mike. <coughs> I would I would I would say absolutely yes. I used to <laughs> I used to get a Hawaiian pizza just about every week. I, I haven't been lately because I'm dieting, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Look, my mm. my people know me as Silent Mike, but my name is Michael Farinaccio, all right? That's not from fucking America. It's from the place <laughs> you would make pizza, and these Americans or Hawaiians or Canadians or whoever are throwing pineapple on our artistry. It really makes me upset on the inside. Is Don't it throw really fruit. Fucking huh. Farinaccio? <laughs> uh, it, it was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. And then, uh, long story short... Uh, my uncle became a professional boxer in the 40s or 50s, and Italians weren't uh, looked highly upon during that mm -hmm, time, so he mm -hmm. switched it to something sounding more American, uh, and then the rest of my family took it. Um, Dude, I always but, assumed you were an Arab. I swear. I, I know. Everyone thinks I'm a little bit of everything, but it's, uh, it's mostly Basque and Italian, even though I'm going to do one of those uh, Swabby deals soon, and we'll find out for real. Oh, the 23andMe nice. kind of thing? Yeah, uh, bought one for my mom on Mother's Day, and then my sister bought one for my mom on Mother's Day, thinking we were both awesome, and then, so now we have two of them, so I'm going to take it. Nice. Um, yeah, so you the, bought yourself you a gift that. for Mother's Day. My, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. My, uh, my grandpa changed our last name, too, like, for the same reason. He was going to acting, and his name was, like, really kind of uh, German-sounding, uh, Meister, and so he changed it to Lewis. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, that was your, uh, uh, the Munsters. The monsters, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that when you were on our podcast. So, so awesome. So nice. I, I would have been Bryce Meister. I, I didn't know that. That has a good ring, though. Which is awesome. Yeah, it has a good ring. My parents came to America. We're like, man, our name is too easy to spell. We should fuck this up. <laughs> Make it work. <laughs> Here we are. So uh, for my answer, though, you know, I'm, I'm kind of neutral about it. I've had good pineapple on pizza, and I've also had, had it where it just felt so out of place. Like I was eating fucking Dole pineapple out of a can on a pizza, and it's just like trash. Mm. I think with like really salty cheese and fresh pineapple, it could be awesome. But, you know, the, my respect for, for the Farinaccios of the world <laughs> has, to, has to, you know, kind of uh... dictate that for me. I just don't like fruit on any of my shit. Like if I'm going to eat fruit, it's going to be a smoothie or fruit. I don't want fruit on my dessert. I don't want fruit on my savory dinner. Uh, if I'm going to have fruit as dessert, it, I could eat an apple. But if I'm going to have a cake, I want a fucking piece of cake. I don't want a little bit of dough with some berries on it. Oh, yeah. Well, fruit, yeah, fruit cake. I don't yeah, know, fruit cakes. Fuck. <laughs> 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 well, I guess that answers that. Uh, to, to sum it up, uh, that's two no's, a yes, and a maybe. <laughs> that adds up to a no, so Walker, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, like, it, to, to sum up what Mark Bell would say about this, fuck your pineapple. <laughs> yeah, and, man. <laughs> and uh, so that that pretty much wraps it up for us on this episode. Uh, Mike, where can we, uh, you know, where can everybody find you on social media in case anybody follows us but not you? Uh, Silent Mike. Uh, search it places. It's with two Ks for some reason on Instagram. Everywhere else it's just one K. Absolutely, and you can uh, you can find his personal Instagram, Michael Farinaccio. Yep. At, uh, <laughs> at at Farinaccio. I should and, make uh, it. I should make it. You, you should. It'd just be photos, just selfies of different different team hats. I'll and show you right now. My uncle's on my wall. Uh, uh, come with me, internet. Oh, it might be too dark. Kind of. Oh, we can see. Oh, hell yeah! Looks kind of boxer. Oh, boxer. he has a boxer's nose for sure. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, he's all kinds and... of fucked up. He kind of looks like me. He looks like uh, uh, what's his name? Um, God, I can't even remember his name. He's in, the lead actor in Raging Bull. Um, uh, Robert De Niro. He looks like Robert De Niro in Raging yeah. Bull when his nose got all messed up when he was all fat at the end of the movie. They call me the young De Niro. Hey, I, I could definitely see that, man. I could see it. Yeah, Omar Esau started that, and then it uh, caught wildfire. Yep. Perfect. Uh, 
There's there's our podcast title. So anyway, uh, th- thank you everyone for listening. As always, uh, I am at Hanny underscore TSA on Instagram. We got Bryce, who is at Bryce underscore TSA, and Eric, who is at Eric underscore TSA. Again, you can send him any messages or emails that you need uh, with regards to questions. <laughs> Uh, one more shout out for our sponsor, LBD Fitness. You can find everything they offer and what they're all about at www.ldbfitness.com. Uh, you can find us at thestrengthathlete.com. And thank you for listening.